everyone. Thank you for joining today's community outreach presentation titled Women and Heart Health, Insights from Female Cardiologists, which is sponsored by CPMC's Canbar Cardiac Care Center. Today, we are fortunate to have a notable panel of cardiologists who will discuss topics related to cardiovascular health in women. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few words about the Canbar Cardiac Care Center. It was originally founded in 2002 at the CPMC Pacific Heights campus and relaunched at the CPMC Van Ness campus in 2022. The center was formed through the generous contributions of the late Maurice Canbar, who was an inventor, innovator, entrepreneur, but more importantly, a philanthropist. The Canberra Cardiac Care Center is one of the highest ranking cardiac health facilities in California and offers an array of cardiac services and specialists who use advanced technologies to diagnose and treat patients with heart disease. Its nationally recognized physicians, surgeons, and clinicians are committed to providing excellent personalized care in a contemporary and welcoming setting. I'd now like to pass the baton to our panel discussion moderator, Betsy Fuselli. Hi, everybody. My name is Betsy Duselli, and I am a nurse practitioner and educator for the cardi um, cardiology division at CPMC's Canbar Cardiac Care Center, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for this afternoon's presentation. In celebration of Heart Month, we are fortunate to have an outstanding panel of Canbar Center cardiologists who will be discussing various aspects of cardiovascular health in women. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share a few words about their background, their area of expertise, and role at CPMC. We will be having three panelists instead of four this afternoon. Let's start with Dr. Modiane. Motiani. Please say a few words about yourself. Thank you, Betsy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Magna Motiani, and I'm a non-invasive and preventative cardiologist here at CPMC. I'm really grateful to all of you for spending a, an hour of your evening with us to learn a little bit about cardiovascular disease as it pertains to women. This is a, pa a topic very near and dear to my heart as preventative cardiology is the reason I went into cardiology. It dates back to my own personal family health history with cardiovascular disease. I'm originally from the Chicagoland area. I completed my graduate training at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I did my postgraduate training at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, followed by a cardiology fellowship at the University of Southern California. A large part of my cardiology fellowship was de dedicated towards preventative cardiology and specifically the management of complex lipid disorders uh, called lipidology. I'm really thrilled to be here with you all and to share with you a little bit about cardiovascular disease in women. Thank you so much, Dr. Modiani. And Dr. Rao, perhaps you can share a few words about yourself. Thanks, Betsy. Um, so I'm Shruti Rao. I'm a current uh, third year cardiology fellow at CPMC. I am originally from Plano, Texas. Um, I grew up in India before then, um, and then uh, moved out to California to CPMC for internal medicine residency, and then stayed on for um, cardiology fellowship. And I'm currently the chief cardiology fellow here. Um, I, you know, my background in cardiology, um, similar to Dr. Motiani, stems from a family history um, of uh, heart disease in the women in my family. Um, so this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, and my uh, future uh, plans are to stay on at CPMC um, as a non-invasive general cardiologist. My areas of interest include um, valvular disease and women's heart health. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Is Dr. Sharma on? Um, yeah, I'm here. I can introduce Oh, yes. Myself. Could you say a uh, few? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anjali Sharma. I'm one of the third year cardiology fellows along with Shruti. Um, thank you for having us today and spending some of your time um, this evening with us. Um, I'm originally from Palo Alto, San Jose, California. Um, did my undergrad training at Berkeley and ended up down in Southern California at USC for med school and then residency. Uh, my interest in cardiology um, and especially in women's health stems from a lot of seeing a lot of differences in health disparities and seeing the differences in how 
and impacts that gender plays a role in management and treatment, especially of cardiovascular diseases. Um, and like, um, you know, my colleagues here, especially being, um, having an Indian heritage, um, also have had a pretty extensive family history of cardiovascular disease um, that has piqued my interest um, in the field as well. Um, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and will be, um, just like Dr. Motiani and um, Shruti. Interests include, um, actually I'm becoming more interested in cardio-oncology, but also preventative um, um, care as well. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, we are fortunate to have such an impressive panel for this afternoon's presentation. I'm going to begin by asking Dr. Modiani some questions about coronary artery disease, so she may tap into her expertise regarding the prevention and treatment of heart disease. So Dr. Modiani, what is the prevalence of heart disease among women in the United States? So as many of our, of our attendees will know, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States. And although male gender has traditionally been perceived as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, it is still the leading cause of death for women. In fact, more than 60 million women in the United States are living with some form of heart disease. And unfortunately, when compared with our male counterparts, we as women have worse survival following a heart attack. That, that then sort of sets the cadence and the objective for our panel today. It's really to increase awareness of heart disease among women. And we really hope that you leave today with a better understanding about your heart, specifically the, the problems that can develop, the symptoms to watch for, and when to seek help. Thank you. Um, now, coronary artery disease is a very broad term. Uh, what actually is coronary artery disease? And are there specific types that occur more commonly in women? So Betsy, I'll, I'll take a step back and I'll say simply diseases of the heart can really be due to problems in, in one of three areas. It can be a problem with the heart muscle or valves, a problem with the heart rhythm, or problems with the heart arteries. So this diagram here on the slide that we have displayed really highlights a few of the abnormalities that can occur with the heart arteries in particular. Problems can occur within the three large heart arteries, which we call coronary arteries or in the small branches off of these large blood vessels called the coronary microvasculature. We can develop lipid-rich deposits on the sides of these blood vessel walls called atherosclerotic plaques. And it's rupture or erosion of these plaques that culminate in a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Women in particular, and patients who have a history of smoking are often more susceptible to spasms in the blood vessel walls. We call this vasospasm. And the symptoms can often mimic that of a heart attack. Around periods of hormonal um, sort of change or hormonal disturbance, so to speak, such as pregnancy, or in the setting of uncontrolled blood pressure, we are susceptible to tears in the innermost component of the blood vessel wall that can result in a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And we have an image displaying that on the right. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so what are some of the risk factors for coronary artery disease that are unique to women, and how can women reduce their risk of developing coronary artery disease overall? So there, there are many risk factors that, that predispose to the development of heart disease broadly, and some of these risk factors are under our control, but unfortunately, some are not. The modifiable risk factors, which we have outlined here in the top component of the slide, are things that won't come as a surprise to many of our attendees. That include a history of smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, abnormal or elevated cholesterol values, and poor nutrition or lifestyle. That includes exercise, sleep, and stress. Other medical conditions, which often have a female predilection, including autoimmune disease or inflammatory disease, can definitely increase the risk of heart disease. The risk factors that we unfortunately don't have control over are listed at the bottom, and those are things like age, our family's health history, our ethnicity, and hormonal changes, including around the time of pregnancy. Uh, can you ex uh, expand a little bit more about emotional stress and depression and alcohol use, excessive alcohol use as a risk factor for coronary artery disease in women? Absolutely. So there was a, every year um, as a community of cardiologists, we convene at a conference called the American College of Cardiology. And the insights derived from our most recent American College of Cardiology's meeting in 2023, we discussed the significant impact that sleep, or specifically sleep deprivation, has on the onset of cardiovascular disease. 
Now, intuitively, I think this makes sense to a lot of us, um, but it was never so uh, sort of well articulated as it was at that national conference. It's really come to light that absence of sleep, disruptive sleep, um, you know, uh, uh, inadequate sleep or sleep conditions can definitely predispose to cardiovascular disease. And your, the second part of your question, you know, specifically commenting on the role of excessive alcohol intake. The American College of Cardiology recommends moderate alcohol consumption. And I'm often asked, well, what, what does that mean? In women, we generally recommend no more than one to two standard drinks per night. And so alcohol in excess of that can certainly lead to disruption of blood pressure, abnormal lipids, specifically triglycerides, and onset of heart failure, one of the topics we'll be discussing later. And one other question about, um, uh, out, you know, you often hear that alcohol can help improve the HDL, um, which is supposed to be the good cholesterol, but, uh, you know, then that doesn't seem uh, ac accurate because it does have uh, detrimental effects. Can you speak to that at all? Absolutely. So we're often asked that here in the cardiology clinic, which is, you know, what is the appropriate amount of alcohol to consume? And, you know, I often find that, uh, here in, in the Western world, we often consume to excess. It's a big part of our social culture. Uh, it's a means to connect with people. And I think for each individual patient, the recommended amount may differ. It's contingent on things like um, whether you have concomitant diabetes, whether you have abnormalities in your lipids, the type of alcohol you're consuming, the pattern or the frequency with which you're consuming it. We know that although the American College of Cardiology recommends up to one to two standard drinks of, of alcohol per night, um, that that does not equivocate to, you know, seven to 14 drinks on one night. It's not the same thing, unfortunately. So the, the sort of conversation with regards to how much is appropriate for me, how much is too much, is a really individual conversation that I think is best served between that individual patient and the provider, recognizing that so many other elements, including other comorbidities, go into that decision-making. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. Uh, can women present with different symptoms of coronary artery disease than men? Absolutely, and I love this diagram here um, displayed from the American Heart Association. You know, during a heart attack, many patients would classically present with severe onset pressure-like pain often over the left side of the chest. It can be associated with radiation to the jaw or to the neck, with shortness of breath, with drenching sweats, or even nausea or vomiting. Women and elderly patients in particular are much more likely to present atypically. That is, we may not have these classic symptoms that we often see displayed on um, schematics such as this one. So it's really important for us as providers to maintain a very high index of suspicion in our female or our elderly patients with risk factors for heart disease. So although chest pain and shortness of breath are certainly symptoms that get you know, the hair on my neck to stand, in a woman with risk factors for heart disease, a whole other constellation of symptoms can certainly indicate the presence of a heart attack. Thank you. Um, now, what tests are usually performed uh, outpatient by your primary care doctor or cardiologist when coronary artery disease is suspected, and there and is there any gender bias involved with them? Absolutely. So, you know, as a preventative cardiologist, I often meet patients patients who are eager to learn more about the risk of heart disease um, and methods to prevent it. But even before we get to that point, I always ask about the presence of symptoms that could indicate that heart disease already exists. So, if you have symptoms concerning for heart disease, your doctor may recommend stress testing. And stress testing is a broad category of testing to understand whether there are significant blockages in the arteries of the heart that are compromising blood flow to the heart muscle itself. Treadmill stress testing, stress echocardiography, and radionuclide stress myocardial perfusion imaging, often um, sort of uh, abbreviated a, a nuclear stress test, are some forms of these stress tests. And when there's a high suspicion of blockages, we may elect to look at the heart arteries with a coronary CT or a coronary angiogram. Each one of these tests have different strengths and different limitations, different risks and different benefits. And I often have an individualized conversation with each patient about which modality is best for them and why. Thank you, Dr. Motiani. Um, you've shared some very important information with our audience. 
I'm going to move along now to and shift our focus to the discussion of arrhythmias and invite Dr. Um, Rao, one of our distinguished cardiac fellows, to discuss this topic. Um, Dr. Rao, briefly, uh, how does the electrical conduction system of the heart generally work? Thanks, Betsy. Um, so yeah, in general, I would say the heart is a very interesting muscle in that it can conduct electricity um, on its own, right? And the general conduction system is outlined here on the diagram on the left, um, which is you start with your SA node or your sinoatrial node, or colloquially dermed, dubbed the um, pacemaker of the heart. It sends out an, one electrical impulse. And the way it travels through this network of electricity within the heart um, is that it goes from the SA node to what we call the atrioventricular or the AV node. Your, if your SA node is the initiator of the electrical impulse, your AV node acts as a gatekeeper. Um, it basically prevents any sort of fast, irregular um, heartbeats from going down into your bottom two chambers of the heart. Um, and so from there, from as the electrical impulse kind of passes through the gate, um, it basically spreads down um, the bundle branch blocks um, and then through the Purkinje fibers, which you see there all outlined in white with the arrows showing how the electrical impulse kind of just generally spreads throughout the bottom chambers of the heart. So essentially you have your SA node giving off an electrical impulse, your top two chambers of the heart, which are the atria contracting, um, filling the bottom two chambers of your heart which are your ventricles. Um, and then as the electrical impulse travels through the AV node and then down through your ventricles, your ventricles contract. Um, and then that kind of pumps the blood out both to your lungs as well as to your body. So um, it's a very kind of coordinated complex um, system, but a, a very fascinating one that ultimately gives you the love dub sound um, of, of, uh, of your own heart. And in terms of um, you know, arrhythmias in general, it can happen when there are either extra beats. Um, sometimes I like to think of that as one category, extra beats from the top chambers of the heart or extra beats from the bottom chambers of the heart, um, oftentimes very minor, um, and then all the way ranging to what we call cardiac arrest which is a, a life-threatening arrhythmia, and it's what causes people to pass out and lose pulse. Um, and so when we think of arrhythmias, um, it's a very broad range, ranging from uh, just extra beats all the way to cardiac arrest. Right. Um, now are there arrhythmias that, that are more common in women? Um, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, you know, women in general, um, in terms of the overall risk of arrhythmias are actually uh, at higher risk than men um, in terms of having extra beats, um, both in the top chambers as well as the bottom chambers. Um, and they're predisposed to, uh, more predisposed than men to arrhythmias coming from the top chambers of the heart. Um, these commonly can be asymptomatic um, where people don't feel anything. Um, you know, or they can be symptomatic. People can feel palpitations, lightheadedness, et cetera. Um, in terms of women in general, um, the most common arrhythmias are what we call uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, um, in which, you know, um, basically it's a fast heart rate um, that's inappropriate, meaning you're at rest, you're sitting down, uh, but your heart rate is elevated for some reason. Um, uh, other very common arrhythmias are all in, um, around the AV node, um, where you can have kind of uh, an electrical impulse that gets trapped and kind of goes circular in that mode and kind of gets stuck and sends down um, a lot of different impulses to your bottom chambers that then can uh, continue to beat uh, really uh, fast. So fast arrhythmias from the top chambers of the heart um, uh, certain ones are more common in women, but um, their risk of developing what I'm sure a lot of our attendees have heard of is atrial fibrillation, which is one of these arrhythmias um, that can predispose you to stroke, 
women thankfully have a lesser um, incidence of that than men, but they tend to do uh, much more poorly once they do get, uh, once they do develop that arrhythmia. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, are there, um, what are some of the risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation? Yeah, um, just, you know, in terms of a uh, little bit about the background of atrial fibrillation, um, going back to this previous slide, uh, you have on the right a, a nice diagram of what atrial fibrillation kind of looks like. If the left side is normal, where things are coming from the SA node, going to the AV node, and then spreading down below, um, the atrial fibrillation basically has, you get all these impulses and the top chambers um, that are kind of overtaking your SA node. They kind of keep firing randomly. And so that results um, in sometimes a fast heart rate. A bunch of your AV node is getting bombarded with all these electrical impulses and it's letting through a lot of them. So your heartbeat can become very fast. Um, and the overall implication of that is that your heart basically works much harder than it needs to be, um, as well as, and which can over time kind of tire out your heart and cause heart failure, which Anjali will talk to you about shortly. Um, and then the other thing atrial fibrillation can do is because your top chambers are not doing this nice contraction, right, uh, where they're squeezing blood and letting it fill the bottom chambers, they're kind of what we call fibrillating, which is you kind of do this, where it's just shaking in place. Um, that can cause a lot of blood in the top chambers to become stagnant. Um, and, you know, you can develop clots inside um, the top chambers of your heart. So that predisposes you to stroke. So atrial fibrillation, you know, is, is basically bad for those reasons, right? It can increase your risk of stroke and potentially cause elevated heart rates. Um, and, you know, your heart no longer functions the way it's supposed to. It's either too fast or it's what we call dyssynchronous. Your top chambers and your bottom chambers don't, you know, nicely contract one after the other. So... AFib is very common. Um, as you can see here, you have, you know, 400, over 450,000 hospitalizations of, a year with that as a prim primary diagnosis. It is a contributory factor in um, a large number of deaths each year. Um, and overall, it's on the rise. Um, and that's because the main risk factor for atrial fibrillation is advancing age. And all of us are tending to live longer. Um, and so in terms of women, we, we live longer than men. So overall higher, we have higher rates of atrial fibrillation, um, just by that fact alone. Um, AFib causes one in seven strokes, um, and strokes caused by AFib tend to go much more poorly for the patient, um, than strokes from other causes. And then some other risk factors, like it's listed here, um, are risk factors for heart disease overall. You know, high blood pressure that's uh, untreated, obesity, um, which can also cause uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, that is a risk factor for AFib. Um, there is slightly a genetic component, but mostly AFib is, a, is an acquired disease. Um, and so diabetes, high blood pressure, your thyroid, um, being hyperactive, any sort of underlying heart disease where the top chambers of your heart stretch out because uh, there's too much fluid in the heart, um, chronic kidney disease, alcohol use surprisingly is a very big component, um, a very common and very big um, trigger for atrial fibrillation. And it actually, there have been multiple studies published that show that even very minimal alcohol use um, can potentiate atrial fibrillation. So um, yeah, it, it is some it is something that we keep an eye out for, and I think has been getting a lot more attention in the media as well as in literature uh, lately. Thank you. I have another question for you. Uh, palpitations is a common symptom reported by women. Uh, when should you worry about them, um, indicating a heart rhythm problem, and can you always feel an arrhythmia? Yeah. So you know, we get a lot of consultations for um, people who have palpitations. A lot of them tend to be women. Um, and it's unclear exactly why it's more predominant. The symptom is more predominant in women, but um, palpitations can indicate a whole host of things um, relating to your heart rhythm. Like I mentioned before, you can have extra beats. A lot of people feel sometimes that their heart is skipping beats. 
um, or that uh, certain beats they can feel, especially at night uh, when they go to sleep. Um, and this is common because, you know, during the day you're running around, you're doing things at night, things are quiet, you're laying down to bed. And I think people become more aware of their heart, um, heartbeats in general. And then some people, you know, have ranges of complaints from, I feel my heart skipping beats, I feel extra beats, um, I feel my heart pounding. Um, and then some people say, I feel my heart fluttering, like it's um, the heart rate is going fast. Um, so most of the time, I will say that the symptom of palpitations is something that is common, but usually does not indicate a very serious heart rhythm problem. Um, you and I here, if I drink an extra cup of coffee, I'm definitely going to have some extra beats. Um, you know, it's caffeine intake, sleep, um, hormonal changes, all these things can contribute to daily variation that can cause intermittent palpitations. Um, but that being said, I think palpitations can also indicate um, a potentially um, potential underlying heart rhythm that needs to be intervened upon. So atrial fibrillation, you can feel your ha fast heart rate or palpitations or fluttering. Um, oftentimes I tell my patients, you know, if you have an Apple watch um, or any sort of a device that can measure your heart rate um, and you're sitting down and it's going very, very fast, that's something definitely to bring up to a doctor to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having heart fluttering, but also I'm noticing my heart rate is very fast. Um, and they might do some digging to figure out why that is and what your underlying heart rhythm is at that point. Um, so while um, intermittent palpitations may be benign, um, obviously when they're accompanying symptoms of I'm feeling very tired, I'm not able to do the exercise that I normally do, um, I'm feeling dizzy or lightheaded, I'm um, having some chest discomfort, those kinds of things um, in concurrence with palpitations raise the risk of heart rhythm problems. And on the flip side, you might have atrial fibrillation or any sort of underlying heart, uh, other underlying heart rhythm problem, but not feel anything. And that's more common, um, you know, especially in the elderly and especially in women, um, to have what we call asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, um, where they have it, but they don't know it um, until Unfortunately, we might see the consequence of it, uh, which might be a stroke. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, and how are heart arrhythmias diagnosed, uh, Dr. Rao? And uh, yeah. how is atrial fibrillation usually treated? Yeah, so atrial fibrillation um, and any other heart rhythm problems can be detected via a heart monitor. So if we feel that um, you know, your symptoms um, are concerning for a heart rhythm problem, we would recommend uh, a heart, heart monitor study. And nowadays they make um, these heart monitors very, very small, easy to wear, um, rather than these kind of clunky uh, boxes that they used to have um, several decades ago. So now, um, you know, they make these a lot of there are a lot of different companies, but um, they make these heart monitors that are essentially almost like stickers. They stick onto your chest um, and they have a button there that you can press um, if you're ever feeling the symptoms um, that you kind of came in with. And that way, what they do is they continuously monitor every heartbeat um, for a period you know, that's predetermined by your doctor. Commonly, we do a two-week monitor. Um, basically, it captures every heartbeat within that two weeks and, you know, charts the rhythm. Um, there's a company that kind of processes it and then sends us the result and we review it. Um, and we kind of see, hey, you know, the patient pressed a button at this time. What was the heart rhythm at that point in time? And it can catch any potential underlying arrhythmia. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. I'm going to uh, transition to Dr. Anjali Sharma. Uh, she's another one of our distinguished CANBAR Cardiac Center Cardiac Fellows, and I'm going to ask her to entertain several questions about heart failure. Dr. Sharma, what is heart failure, and what are some of the causes that are more common in women? Yeah, that's a really good um, question, Betsy. So heart failure is really a clinical syndrome um, that's caused by 
the inability of the heart to adequately circulate blood um, to the rest of the body and perfuse the organs. Um, and there's several types of heart failure, um, as you can see here. So um, one of the things that I think Dr. Motiani pointed out really well was that there's kind of three buckets that we always talk about with patients. Um, one of them is the coronary arteries, which can kind of be called, um, it's essentially the plumbing of a house, we call it. And then there's the wiring, as Dr. Rao mentioned, the arrhythmias, um, the wiring of the house. And then there's the structures, the walls of the house, and the doors are, are the valves um, between each chamber. So when understanding heart failure, we the way I kind of like to explain it to patients is that there's different types to it. There's either an issue where the walls of you know, the chamber of your heart are too weak to pump blood adequately to the rest of the body. Um, or there's an issue with filling where the walls are too thick and they're unable to relax. So during that diastolic phase, they're unable to relax and expand sufficiently to be able to provide enough blood flow to the rest of the body. Um, and the way we know it is obviously heart failure with um, reduced um, ejection fraction, um, which is um, less than uh, 40%, and then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is greater than or equal to 50%. And then there's the intermediate um, range as well. Um, and then in terms of like what's what causes are more common in women, causes of heart failure are pretty um, similar to what causes um, and, you know, um, factors play a role in increased rates of atrial fibrillation or coronary artery disease. So it's all really interconnected, but um, hypertension um, can really increase your risk of heart failure by like two or three fold. There's also arrhythmias, as Dr. Rao mentioned and talked about, um, coronary artery disease, um, as we know, and um, excessive alcohol intake, which as you all have already heard is a recurring theme here um, in affecting not only the structure, but the rhythm um, and also coronary artery disease. Um, okay, great. I'm just looking at them. Um, so, uh, oh, so uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, what are some symptoms that might indicate that you have heart failure and how is heart failure usually diagnosed? Yeah, so heart failure, um, as mentioned, is a clinical syndrome. So it's diagnosed by not only a structural issue of the heart, whether it be a reduced ejection fraction or diastolic dysfunction, but also symptoms. So we always ask for that. The most specific symptoms we really look out for is orthopnea. So again, um, issues with um, breathing when lying flat on your back. And then we also look for um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is symptoms, you know, at night. Um, we often ask them, oh, do you have issues where you feel like you have to wake up frequently at night? And how many pillows do you sleep on? Um, those are, again, the most specific symptoms. Other symptoms, which are also listed here, include dizzy, uh, dizziness or fatigue, um, especially um, issues with um, exercise um, tolerance, shortness of breath, so dyspnea um, at rest, if it's severe or at exertion as well. Um, sometimes chest discomfort or chest pain. Um, a lot of times because you have these issue, this issue with the heart filling or um, you know, contracting sufficiently and providing blood to the rest of the body, this can cause a backup of blood at increased filling pressures, which can lead to you know, your liver to be congested, hepatic congestion and decreased appetite and gut edema. So a lot of patients might notice feeling more bloated or having a decreased appetite. And then um, classic findings as well are lower extremity um, swelling that they would have noticed um, with specifically pitting edema. Um, again, um, meaning that when you press your finger on their um, their tibia, um, you'll notice um, for a couple seconds, you'll notice that there is still an indentation there. Um, and then they'll also oftentimes have an elevated um, jugular vein. Um, and our trick is to always look 
actually from the ear and then trace your um, eye down because oftentimes people that are really fluid overloaded, um, they have what's called the ear wiggle sign, which means their vein is so, um, the filling pressures are so high and um, it's almost, it's causing this like almost pulsatile, pulsatile motion of the ear. Um, not actually called the ear wiggle sign, but we informally call it that. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what are what is the usual treatment for heart failure and what are some lifestyle yeah. modifications that need to be made if you're diagnosed with heart failure? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So I'll say that um, treatment of heart failure, it's more like management of heart failure where you can never fully reverse your heart failure to progressive disease. And what you can do though, is manage the symptoms and then also manage um, it from progressing into more severe stages of heart failure. And um, this is a really great diagram because it lists exactly what we recommend initially, which is lifestyle changes, you know, diet and exercise, um, lifestyle modifications. A lot of patients, um, and this is more common in women who have preserved ejection fraction, one of the main causes of um, HEFPEF or, you know, preserved ejection fraction is obesity. So we recommend, you know, diet and lifestyle, weight loss if able. Um, sometimes doctors might prescribe oxygen at home for symptomatic purposes, but really it's not a treatment therapy. Um, and then medications to really help your heart and improve the ejection fraction long term. So that really varies with if they're um, heart function is reduced, right? Their ejection fraction is reduced or if it's preserved. If it's a preserved ejection fraction, the medications are, um, there's less medications, but recent trials have shown that SGLT2 inhibitors have had a really beneficial role in um, patients with HEF-PEF as well as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then an MRA like um, aldosterone or a plerinone um, has been shown to be effective in HEF-PEF. And then for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we recommend a beta blocker and um, Entresto, you know, an ARNI, um, if able. And then if for whatever reason they cannot get that, then an ACE or an ARB in, in lieu of that. Um, and then Lasix or Bumex as um, diuretics for symptom management to maintain eubulimia and a low sodium diet, less than 2000 milligrams a day, we usually recommend. Um, there's also considerations of how do we improve the heart function through, you know, interventions. As you know, like coronary artery disease is a very common cause of heart failure and opening up those blockages if there's viable tissue can improve the heart function. Um, and on top of that, um, synchronization, um, um, cardiac resynchronization, resynchronization therapy, um, placing that device, if you have a very large left bundle branch block and a reduced um, ejection fraction can provide some benefit in recovery of the ejection fraction. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so if you're diagnosed with end stage heart failure, how does gender play a role in the evaluation for a heart transplant or a left ventricular assist device? Yeah, thanks, Betsy. That's a really good question. So um, first I'll go, um, start off by kind of describing what advanced heart failure is. Um, so as we've kind of mentioned, heart failure is a chronic condition. And once you reach the advanced stage, um, it really means you're refractory to medications, right? You, We can only increase your guideline directed medical therapy so much, and you're actually unable to tolerate it because oftentimes patients become hypotensive. Um, it's refractory to medications like diuretics, um, or they have dangerous arrhythmias, as Dr. Rao mentioned, ventricular arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia. Um, a lot of these, um, and frequent rehospitalizations as well, um, especially in a short span of time, like a year or six months, can really indicate a decline into end stage heart failure. And at that point, we consider advanced therapies. And there's really two advanced therapies to consider here. Um, it's heart transplant, as we all know, and then a left ventricular assist device, which is typically for patients who don't qualify for a heart transplant, well, be it age or other issues, um, and are unable to get a heart transplant. Um, for women specifically, there's been multiple studies that have shown that um, despite having, you know, advanced heart failure, there's less women um, who get heart transplants and LVADs um, 
compared to men. I think only 25% of um, patients listed for heart transplant were women, which as you know, um, coronary artery disease, uh, hypertension, all these factors that contribute to heart failure are very much pre just as prevalent in women than men, yet um, only a fourth of them uh, those who are listed as heart for heart transplants are women, which is a very gross disparity that I know a lot of um, institutions are working on um, kind of studying more and seeing how they can bridge that disparity. Um, in terms of outcomes um, of advanced heart failure, it's been shown that women, though their outcomes for like LVAD um, or heart transplant are the same as, as, um, as men, they do have um, often aren't are not only are they not listed, but for those with advanced heart failure in general, they have lower quality of life metrics. So they have more symptoms, more more rates of depression, which is very hard, um, common in patients with heart failure who have this you know chronic condition that's very debilitating. Um, but there's more um, a higher portion of women have um, issues with quality of life as well. Thank you so much. So interesting. Um, uh, well, clearly, uh, you're all very passionate about the work you do and have undoubtedly enriched the lives of all those you've touched. Um, thank you for spending so much time with us talking with this, uh, the Sutter community and sharing your knowledge and expertise to further increase awareness about cardiovascular health in women. But we have a few questions here from the audience that I'd like uh, uh, to uh, have Lily ask and see if uh, we can, if I, if, you know, to answer any of the other the specific questions that the audience might have about heart disease. Lily, do you see any of those questions from the Q and A? Yeah, I have five questions here. I'll go ahead and get started. This first one kind of circles back to what Dr. Motiani was talking about. Um, with aging, many experience one or more sleep disrupt disruptions due to urination. What level of heart risk does this present? That's a great question. And, you know, one of the um, most common reasons that patients have dis disordered or disrupted sleep is for the reason you just mentioned, having to wake up in the middle of the night to, to use the restroom. There are a whole host of other causes, of course, that can result in sleep disturbances, including insomnia and sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea. Regardless of what the mechanism or the cause for this sleep disruption is, we know that it poses an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The postulated mechanism is that in having disrupted sleep, we have an increase in the release of stress hormones, namely cortisol, and that cortisol elevated over chronic or long periods of time can lead to premature development of blockages in the arteries of the heart. Now, recognizing that our understanding of the relationship between sleep and cardiovascular disease is still in its sort of early or you know, kind of rudimentary um, uh, understanding, they haven't yet incorporated you know, disordered sleep or um, disrupted sleep into our understanding of overall cardiovascular risk. So to that end, we don't know if you get six hours of sleep versus five hours of sleep, what impact that has on overall risk of cardiovascular disease. But fundamentally, we do know that disruptive or disordered sleep or absence of sleep does lead to that release of, of um, stress hormones, specifically cortisol, that plays a role long-term in the development of those um, cholesterol deposits on the sides of the blood vessel walls. So regardless of how disruptive that sleep is, it's a really important conversation to have with your primary care physician or with your cardiologist. We're here to serve as your advocates and your allies to determine what is causing that disordered or disruptive sleep and how can we help, recognizing that it's likely to pay dividends down the road with reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease. Great answer. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Martiani. Um, moving on, and these the rest of these questions are really open to all the panelists. Um, please feel free to jump in if you have an answer. Um, this next one is asking whether um, right, branch, right bundle branch blocks um, increase your risk for a heart attack or stroke, and if so, how often should this be monitored? Um, I can take this one, Lily. Uh, this is a great question. 
And right bundle branch block is a common finding um, that we see on um, an electrocardiogram uh, or an ECG. So um, this is basically the short answer is in patients with no um, major underlying heart disease that, that is known, right? Um, just having a right bundle branch block, which basically means that the right bundle um, in the right ventricle bottom chamber um, is, is basically has a conduction problem, a little bit of a blockage. Um, if you don't have any underlying heart disease, then um, in and of itself, a right bundle branch block doesn't um, have any, uh, is considered benign and doesn't have any uh, independent, it's not an independent risk factor um, for morbidity or mortality. But um, in patients who either go on to develop heart, di heart disease or already have underlying heart disease, um, then right bundle branch block can actually increase um, your mortality. Um, and that basically comes from the fact for a few different things, because for example, if you have a heart attack, um, you know, which can often cause electrical disturbances in the heart, having an underlying right bundle branch block would increase um, your risk for an adverse outcome, right? A bad outcome from that heart attack. Um, especially, you know, even if you think about heart failure, for example, which basically isn't, as Dr. Sharma pointed, is an inability to pump um, effectively. Uh, the right bundle branch block basically means your right ventricle um, the bottom chamber on the right has a delayed electrical signal. So it doesn't pump in, in kind of nice uh, cohesion with the left ventricle. It, it pumps a little bit later. Um, and so that kind of dyssynchrony causes a decreased ability um, for your heart to pump uh, blood out into your, your lungs, your, your body effectively well. Um, and so in and of itself doesn't really cause a problem, but usually if you already have heart failure, can can kind of potentiate that as well. So the short answer is that a right bundle branch block in and of itself doesn't really, um, is not really of concern um, and doesn't need to be monitored. Um, you know, obviously getting an ECG um, every few years or so or every year um, would be something to, to consider in those patients. Um, to ensure that they're not developing any other uh, conduction abnormalities, um, but it, it, and this is provided if they have doesn't didn't have a heart attack or have any underlying heart disease in general, but um, it's something definitely uh, to keep an eye out for if you already have. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, next. Bear with me. This one is a little bit longer, um, has some more details here. We have somebody asking um, about, they have several risk factors. Um, it sounds like their father died of a heart, a massive heart attack at age 49. Um, mother had a history of heart attack in her late 70s. What, what does this mean for this person and what tests could be suggested? Yeah, so I can um, talk about this one. Um, so the risk factors um, are really important to note. The significant one out of the two parents, we look at their age that they had the heart attack. Um, the father's is significant um, for family history of coronary artery disease. And then other risk factors, we typically look to really risk stratify someone as primary prevention for cardiovascular disease is you know hypertension, um, cholesterol levels, um, LDL and HDL, we look at as well as uh, smoking history, diabetes, et cetera. Um, one of the things um, these days that we're recommending for, again, primary prevention, um, preventing a cardiovascular event is um, a CT calcium score. And what that does is it looks at the level of calcium um, of your coronary arteries, those blood vessels. Um, that Dr. Motiani was talking about that give blood to the heart. And that is what, um, when there's a blockage of that blood vessel, it can cause a heart attack. So um, 
oftentimes, and we're kind of going more towards this for primary prevention for our patients who are referred to us, or um, your PCP can even do this, they'll typically order a lipid panel and A1C to assess for prediabetes or diabetes. Um, obviously, they'll know what your blood pressure is and if you're on medications or not, as well as your smoking history. And then um, as an added um, kind of an adjunct to all of these risk factor risk factors will also do a CT calcium score, um, which again, your primary care doctor or um, referral to cardiology, we can, we can do for you as well. Great, thanks Dr. Sharma. Um, next, can tachycardia cause a heart attack? Um, yeah, I can take that one. Uh, the short answer is in and of itself, tachycardia doesn't cause a heart attack. Um, but what it does do, which tachycardia means, you know, an elevated heart rate um, above 100 beats per minute. It, what it does do is make your heart work harder. So for patients um, who have or already have maybe some minimal um, coronary artery disease, which means just atherosclerotic plaque causing mild blockages, um, which you know largely they, they're unaware of, right? Because it's not significant, it doesn't cause symptoms. But let's say they get sick or have some sort of um, high fever or anything that can raise your heart rate for a long period of time, um, then what it can indicate is your heart works much harder, uses up much, and, and it needs a lot more blood flow uh, to keep that up. And because they have underlying, you know, heart artery disease, um, the blood flow, you know, kind of doesn't, can't keep up with how hard the heart needs to work and the heart rate is so high. Um, we call this demand ischemia. So it can result in reduced blood flow to the heart arteries. Um, usually if this is, um, we treat the underlying condition that's causing high heart rate, right? Whether it be an arrhythmia or an infection. Um, and so we bring the heart rate back down. And in patients um, that show, you know, if they're in the hospital, for example, they have labs that show that their heart is working really hard and, and has compromised blood flow when the heart rate is really high, um, then they might need a, what we call an ischemic evaluation. Basically, we need to take a look and see how um, bad their heart artery blockages are, um, you know, and that can be done, doesn't have to be done in the hospital, can be done outpatient as well. So um, in and of itself, a high heart rate doesn't cause a heart attack, but can cause reduced blood flow in certain situations if in patients with underlying heart disease. Great, thanks Dr. Rao. I have another sort of related question I'm gonna jump down to. Um, this person has occasional tachycardia at rest without palpitations with history of atrial flutter. Is that a risk for stroke? Yeah, so if you've already been diagnosed with atrial flutter, and I see this question, they've had a few ablations already, um, then, you know, the fact that you've had a few ablations means it's been recurring, right? Um, and the fact that you have elevated heart rate can indicate that you have periods of recurrent atrial flutter. Um, and like we mentioned before, it's common to actually be completely asymptomatic, um, you know, during periods of high heart rates with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Um, so the key here is to figure out what is the heart rhythm doing during these um, periods of elevated heart rate. Um, is it just, you know, normal rhythm for some reason that's a little bit elevated um, at that time? Um, or is it you know, recurrent atrial flutter. If it's recurrent atrial flutter, which your heart is kind of going in and out of normal rhythm and atrial flutter, normal rhythm and atrial flutter, um, then, you know, that does overall increase your risk for stroke. Um, and the fact that it's, you know, if it is demonstrating a recurrence, um, it would, you would need to be on a blood thinner for stroke prevention in that setting. You, Dr. Rao. Next, can you please describe heart valve issues, causes, symptoms, and treatments? 
Um, I can talk about that because I think the last question is actually very fitting for Dr. Motiani about cholesterol. Um, but basically, as I kind of mentioned, um, you know, the three different aspects of the heart, the heart valve is really the doorway between one chamber of the heart to the next. And um, the valve issues that we run into is is the doorway not opening enough, meaning is it really stenotic and won't open fully, and therefore there's issue of blood flowing from one chamber to the other? Um, or is it too leaky, meaning it won't close properly and blood actually flows in the opposite direction? And this could be either the kind of frame around the door is too wide, so even though the door um, the door itself is normal in size. If the frame's too wide, you have this wide open space that's open where blood can flow backwards and cause leakiness of the valve. So that's called valvular regurgitation. Whereas valvular stenosis is mean, you means you can't open that door at all because it's like jammed. And oftentimes um, what we see um, when we look at the valve, it's very calcified um, and fibrotic and can't open properly. Um, what causes it? It really depends on where you are. So in third, third world countries, um, rheumatic heart disease is one of the most common causes of um, valvular disease, um, you know, and as you can imagine, becomes an issue when um, women become pregnant and they have this these issues where the valve is too narrow and tight and stenosed. Um, here, what we see a lot of is aortic valve stenosis, um, and that can oftentimes occur from a congenital um, abnormality called bicuspid aortic valve, where over time, your valve, instead of having three leaf leaflets, has two leaflets, and there is abnormal kind of blood flow through that valve, and it can become more and more fibrosed and calcified over time as well. Um, treatment is um, when the symptoms become severe enough, severe enough where they can impact the structure of the heart, like the walls and chambers of the heart, where it can cause reduced filling or an enlarged um, chamber um, or significant symptoms, then um, valve replacements. It really depends on what the problem is, but we can do valve replacements. These days there's transcatheter procedures where they can do valve replacements in the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Um, and then if it's an issue with leakiness, um, sometimes you can actually clip um, the leaflets of the valve together um, and in part alleviate a little bit of the leakiness of that valve. So there's many different ways of treating valves. Um, really, if your primary care doctor or cardiologist hears a murmur, um, that's significant. They usually get an ultrasound of the heart to really better assess that valve and see how leaky or narrow it in fact is. Um, and symptoms vary from a wide range of really what um, you know type of valve is affected, but would usually look for shortness um, of breath, especially with exertion, decreased exercise tolerance, and for aortic stenosis, um, symptoms of heart failure, which we talked about, and then um, chest pain or lightheadedness, dizziness, or syncope. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Does heritable risk, risk come from your mother's or father's side of the family or equally? I can take that one. Um, the answer is it, it, it's really kind of both sides of your family. Um, so when we uh, meet our patients for the very first time and we are talking about cardiovascular risk assessment and prevention of cardiovascular disease, we take a, a full history and we really pay very close attention to your family's health history. As I think another attendee um, brought up, you know, uh, that particular uh, attendee had a family history of heart disease, father having a heart attack at age 47. We pay close attention to not only what type of heart disease members in your family have had, but also the age at which they've had that particular condition. When we see a family history of patients, um, or I should say when, when patients have a family history of heart disease early in life, age you know, less than 45 in a man or less than 55 in a woman, that signifies what we call premature cardiovascular disease and even puts that particular patient at heightened risk. So to answer your question, it, it really um, it's contingent on both sides of your family. And when you see a cardiologist or your primary care physician with the intention of learning more about your cardiovascular risk, we pay close attention to both sides of the family, mother, father, grandparents on either side, and your siblings, in addition to your children, 
when we understand the role that family plays in your risk. Thank you, Dr. Motiani. And it looks like the last few questions actually are related to the topics that you um, kind of answered earlier. Jumping back to sleep, I'm going to wrap two of these kind of together. Um, first, is there a number of hours that we should aim for um, to get at, like how much sleep we should get? And then can taking statins offset the damage of insufficient sleep causing cholesterol deposits in the arteries? If you don't mind answering both of those. Absolutely. Great question. So, you know, based on our, our um, national conference last year at the American College of Cardiology, the, the sort of resounding kind of agreement was that generally patients should be achieving for six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep per night. I always talk with my patients about sleep hygiene, and I often emphasize that the bedroom should only be for sleep and for sex. Joking aside, we really should not be on our phones, watching TV, scrolling you know, on our phones. Um, we really should be using the bedroom as a time to unwind, to get in the right mind space, to move forward with sleep. We often talk in my cardiology clinic about, you know, what else goes into good sleep hygiene, um, things like, you know, room darkening shades, um, white noise machines, sleep masks to prevent or mitigate the effects of light. All of those things sort of set the stage for healthy sleep. We then talk about how do we promote deep sleep? How do we promote, um, you know, sort of uh, interruptions throughout the night? That often for my male patients with enlarged prostates involves restricting fluids for two to three hours before bedtime. So they're less likely to have to get up in the middle of the night. So there's sort of myriad of strategies that set the stage for good sleep. But ideally, we should be shooting for six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep per night. And I think, sorry, the second part of that question, Lily, you had highlighted was, can taking statins offset the damage of poor sleep? Unfortunately, I don't think it works that way. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish that, you know, we could sort of solve one problem, you know, with, or I should say we should, we could sort of, you know, fix one problem by addressing another. And unfortunately, I think they're two independent risk factors for cardiovascular disease. While statins are a great tool to help patients with abnormal cholesterol profiles, it doesn't sort of obviate the need for good quality sleep. So there are two independent processes, both of which are equally important, achieving and striving for good quality sleep, and also making sure that your cholesterols are well addressed. Thank you, Dr. Motiani. And that's kind of a great segue into our last question. Um, can you speak to cholesterol and heart health risks? What the numbers signify once you are, or what numbers signify that you're in the at-risk uh, category? Absolutely. So in my preventative cardiology clinic, we talk about the myriad of components that go into an overall or global assessment of cardiovascular risk. And lipids is just one component of that understanding of cardiovascular risk. Historically, we used to check four values on a lipid profile, and many of the attendees will be familiar with these, having looked at their own labs themselves. And those four values included the total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, an HDL cholesterol, and a triglycerides. And although historically we would focus on, um, you know, achieving particular targets or thresholds, our understanding of lipids has evolved. We have a deeper and richer understanding of, well, you know, sort of uh, what the lipids really do and their role in, in the, uh, the sort of genesis of the plaques on the sides of the blood vessel walls. We certainly know that in patients with elevated LDL levels, they have increased cardiovascular risk. And that data is demonstrated over population-wide studies spanning many years. But we've also learned that in patients with normal LDL levels or low LDL levels, according to the standard cutoffs, they too could go on to develop cardiovascular disease. And to that end, as a community of lipidologists, we had to delve back into our understanding of lipid basics, lipid metabolism, and atherogenesis of plaques. To that end, we understand that even when patients have low LDL levels, if they have other markers of abnormal lipid metabolism, elevated lipoprotein little a, abnormal ApoB, particle size and particle count also play an equally important understanding in a patient's overall cardiovascular risk. So I, I often, um, on sort of initial consultation, will request both a traditional lipid profile as well as what we call advanced lipoprotein diagnostics. 
that is characterizing those other markers that I just highlighted, size, particle number, uh, APOB, LP little a. This gives me a more global understanding of your individual risk as it pertains to the lipids. I'm often asked, well, what are good levels? What should I be targeting for? Or when will we know if the treatment has been successful? And truly, the, the goal is individualized. We know that in patients who have already had a heart attack, who have already had a stroke, or those who've already had evidence of blockages in the arteries of the legs requiring procedures to fix those blockages, that they are of the highest risk. And it accordingly follows that those patients have the lowest goals for values like LDL cholesterol, LDL particle count. But for patients that have not, unfortunately not experienced those manifestations of cardiovascular disease, we account for other factors, including age, gender, ethnicity, family history, presence of high blood pressure, presence of diabetes, to determine how aggressive do we need to be with your lipids and what are the best tools to get you to that goal. Now more than ever, we have more tools at our disposal to bring the lipids into range. Those can include, you know, sort of more holistic-based therapies for patients that are not inclined to take a prescription medication, red yeast rice, berberine, and for those that are receptive to taking a particular medication, statins are a wonderful choice, although I truly think that they've received a lot of negative press over the last few years but we have many other choices for patients that can tolerate statins or, or, or are nervous about it. We have bile acid sequestrants, PCSK9 inhibitors, apheresis, bempedoic acid. Now more than ever, we have more tools to help you bring your lipids into goal if statins aren't working or you're, you're nervous about taking those. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Dr. Thank I appreciate you all staying late as well. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining the Canbar Cardiac Care Center for this presentation. Thank you to Betsy, our moderator, and all of the panelists for taking the time out of your busy schedules to present on such a significant topic or topics. Mm -hmm. um, Canbar Cardiac Care Center will be continuing these uh, community education events related to cardiac health every other month. So just keep an eye out for emails regarding upcoming presentations. Thank you all again and have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you for having Thank us. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.